write down a sentence, please. What a pity I have nothing better to do with my life than to destroy it unknowingly. What a pity I have nothing better to do with my life than to destroy it unknowingly. Unknowingly is a key word. The road to hell is always traveled by unconscious people, by people who don't know they're going downhill because they call downhill uphill. They call downhill uphill. They call their pains their pleasures, the pains they get from hurting themselves and injuring other people of behaving like devils, like sneaks, like cowards. The pain and the punishment they get from that is their form of pleasure. I want to talk, half talk to you tonight and half discuss with you a very fundamental point. And I'm going to give you a lot of points to read. I'm going to read, rather. And you can write down as many as you like. But let me set it very clearly at the start. We are here in these classes fundamentally to do one thing, to do one thing. We're here to change our nature. We're here to change totally the way we think, feel, act, react. We're here to change our na nature profoundly and once and for all. We're here to commit ourselves to changing the very nature that we have. And at the start, we have no notion of what that consists of, because all we know is our old nature, which we've lived with and suffered from up to this point. Now, very fortunately for us, there is a way in which you, I, anyone who wants it, can change the kind of a human being they actually are. But the only person who really understands what it means to change himself or herself is one who has actually done it, who has actually died to himself, gone through his hundreds of hells, suffered more deeply than he suffered before, and suffered in a new way in order to get rid of the nature that he was living in and which bogged him down and kept him unconsciously and unknowingly destroying himself. Having accomplished this, there is no way he can directly transmit his experience to other people who want it. All he can do is use words proper encouragement, tell other people the direction of the experience. And as he does this, or she does this, she loses practically everyone sooner or later along the way to self-transformation. Because few human beings, few, very, very few, have any intention at all of changing the kind of a man, the kind of a, a woman, the kind of a human being they are inwardly. They really don't want it. And the person who has actually changed himself inwardly can tell those who say they want to change, he can tell them about every single trap they will fall into he can tell them, for example, that one of the major traps all along the way, not just once, but a thousand times you'll fall into it, is the trap of living from imagination about who you are. Imagination 
used wrongly is one of the most dreadful enemies any of us ever have towards self-awakening. You've been told many times before that imagination can satisfy wrongly the old nature which wants to remain old and yet pretend that it is new, that it has changed itself. So just remember that one point for now, that you may and are living in dozens of imaginations right now about perhaps the progress you're making, uh, of how you'll be a year from now if you apply yourself. You have imaginations perhaps toward other people in the room, toward me, toward truth itself. And one of your imaginations, and you listen, one of your imaginations is that your best friends are pretty nice people after all. You really think this. You think they're nice people. They're not nice, nice people and neither are you because they're still living in their old nature which behaves nicely only when a certain kind of reward, reward of friendship, of money, of sex or whatever comes its way and you want to maintain those rewards. So what I want to do tonight is go over with you some things which do not change human nature, which do not make this authentic, authentic born-again experience. I don't even like to use the word because that's just as much a lie in most people's lives as the word love or pa compassion or whatever. But this is what Christ was talking about, <clears throat> finding a new nature, being born again, by going through certain internal processes suffering greatly from it, perhaps, certainly rather, suffering greatly from it, and yet using it right while you're suffering so that you come out a different kind of a person than you were before, who is not going to put up with nonsense out there anymore because you've first made up your mind you're not going to put up with it in yourself. That is legitimate. If you make up your mind tonight in even a small way that you're not going to put up with the stupidity and the lies and the viciousness inside yourself, then you have a legitimate reason for saying to your wife, your husband, your friend, everybody, I am not going to put up with any stupidity from you anymore. If you want to be in my life, then begin to behave yourself just as I am trying to behave myself. And if you don't want to, farewell. And it becomes very easy to say farewell to stupid people because you have seen the marvelous real benefits you get from having earlier said farewell to your own stupidities. Don't you understand that they're the same thing? that you're not going to tolerate that cruel person in your life anymore because you're not tolerating your own cruelty anymore from yourself. All right, let's find out, and I'll read these and get some down perhaps. In our effort to change from mechanical behavior to conscious behavior, from cruel uh, behavior to decent behavior, from uh, psychic sleep to spiritual wakefulness. Here are the, some of the things human nature does not change from. Some of these you've heard, perhaps some of these are new. Human nature does not change from suffering alone. If that changed human nature, wouldn't all of us be changed in the twinkling of an eye? We've all suffered, all of us. Does it change from threats? The preacher condemns you to hell if you don't change your ways. Does that, that cause you to change inwardly? Or does it just make you scared and hate that kind of a religion? Human nature does not change. This one should be obvious to you. It doesn't change from human laws, does it? And the law says you mustn't discriminate against this person or you mustn't do this or that against your fellow man. Does that change nature at all? 
That's simply a law that's on the books that has a threat to it and says, if you do this or that, you'll go to jail. That doesn't change the kind of a person I am. I conform to those laws simply to not be punished by the policeman and the judge. We don't get changed by sympathy, do we? Does sympathy ever change anyone? Or does sympathy fall on our self-centeredness so that we, you know, one of the worst things you can ever do with someone is tell them that they've been persecuted. Boy, will they lap that up and agree with you. Oh, I've been persecuted, either personally or racially. Does moral teachings change the kind of a person I am? Moral teachings, be good to others and they will be good to you, which is a lie to begin with. They'll take you just as you've taken them after they've done you some good. Human nature doesn't change from, listen to this, human nature does not change from constant exposure to truth. Could a person come to a meeting like this, as has happened, and sit here for a year's worth of meetings and then go out in hatred all of a sudden or fall away all of a sudden? The simple mechanical exposure to truth does anything, do anything for anyone? Not at all. Because all the time that the truth is being given here, which it is, the mind is taking it and twisting it the way it wants to twist it in order to preserve the old nature or to get a false thrill out of it or to even nod your head hoping that someone next to you sees you nodding your head and what a marvelous, agreeable student you are. <laughs> It doesn't change by punishment, which is very close to threats, which we had before. It doesn't change by comfort. It doesn't change by excitements. Human nature doesn't change from pleasures, from successes. I'm sure you've read and perhaps you've experienced, of, especially in the case of men, I'm sure all of us, to one degree or another, perhaps when we were younger, were quite sure that that success we wanted, whether it was the marriage or the business success or to do a lot of traveling or to build this or that, we were quite sure that that success would make us feel better. What happened when you got it? Nothing. Nothing really. We're just as scared. So any kind of a material success doesn't change the kind of a person I am inwardly. Scolding doesn't change human nature. Following religious teachings doesn't change human nature. Belief in what you call God doesn't change human nature. Helping others, talking about love. The list could be extended to thousands of things that do not change us. I could just sit here and go on for a long time, perhaps. For example, common, ordinary daydreaming about your future, how better things are going to be. Even at the short-term future, if you've got a nice special program you want to watch tonight and you're looking forward to it very much, you know what that's doing? That's simply putting a wall between you and you being aware of what you're doing right now. And that is certainly going to cut off you changing who you are and the kind of a person you are. All right, start way back. This calls for this great self-honesty that we've urged so much. Think for a minute. If all your barriers, your inner barriers, were out of the way right here now, seated in this room, and those of you listening to this tape, what kind of a human being would we really see down in there? You don't like to think much about that, do you? How, how, many, how many people do you hate? How many people, listen to this, I'll change that a little bit. This will get you. How many people are you tied to by the chain of hatred? Or a group of people, whether it's a policeman or your relatives or whatever. You're tied to them by your own chain of, of hatred, and I wonder whether you really see it or not. 
the hatred being something very falsely valuable to us and something that's going to prevent you and me from changing and being free of the self-torment of hatred. You don't see that. You don't see that every time you permit this foreign invader of a hostile thought toward anyone for anything, you don't see that you become that hostility yourself. You say, well, that's a thought. That thought is you at the moment. You tell me, when you're hostile, when you're hostile towards someone, who are you at that moment besides that hostility? You are no one. You're the whole business itself. And that's why you burn. You're going to have to spend many, many years walking around your living room, driving your car, shopping down at the market, doing this or that. At the same time you're walking down that, that market aisle, you're going to watch your mind in operation so it goes back to that incident of one minute ago in the market or of 30 years ago with that friend you used to have. And so for the first time you stop your cart, your grocery cart right in the middle of it, and you say, ah, that's the first time I've really understood what I've heard 50 times in that class, that I am taken over by a foreign force, the devil if you want to call it that, who has taken possession of my mind briefly, and then on an accidental level, I escaped from the devil because I finally saw the fresh ears of corn in the produce section that I want. And if the ears of corn take you away from the hostility, hostile thought that you had and were, if the ears of corn take you away from it, then an accident took you away from it, and an accident will take you right back to it again when something out there, an association or an association inside, sparks off the same thing. Now you tell me whether you are a slave or not. You tell me whether you're an unconscious, unknowing slave or not. The reason we're doing this, doing all this, is to begin to detect, detect to the point where we, we fairly faint at how bad off we are, how we can't slow down. We can't even slow down and put ourselves in the other person's place. I swear to you, you're going to walk up someday, maybe 20 minutes from now, or out in the back, that backyard, some of you, to show you how asleep you are. You're going to walk over to someone else in this room and you're going to, way back in your mind, detect sadness on this man's face or preoccupation on that woman's face or a certain vague lostness on that person's face. You're going to detect it and you're going to be so cruel and so asleep to walk right up to that person and pile your blabbermouthery and your troubles right onto him, onto her. This shows you have no love in you at all. Are you the only human being who exists on earth? Apparently you think you do because this is the way you behave. Besides, you're vicious. You know that when that person is lost, and you can tell by the eyes, of course you can. You don't have to be a psychologist. You also detect the weakness in that person. You also detect that that person wants to be liked because that goes with weakness. And you're going to be so cruel, so thoughtless, as to go right up and unload your troubles, your blabbermouthery onto him or her. And you are the cause of millions of human beings being killed in war, in crime, and because you walk over and talk to that person, because you're a machine who has no choice, you are the cause of every starvation on earth. All the, all the sick people who can't get well because there's no <coughs> doctors or no medicine, because all the money's been spent on machine guns 
and you don't even know that you were the cause of that little girl being blasted off the face of the earth with that gun. Until you begin to see quite deeply what we're talking about, see that there are thousands of things that do not contribute to changing the kind of a person, the kind of a man or woman we are. Until you begin to see that there are thousands of things that do not contribute to conscience, to real change. Let me rephrase that. If you will see that first, and this is what I'm trying to get over to you tonight. If you will begin to see that, that you're completely self-centered, no world exists beside yours and none has a right to exist. No one has any problem more important than yours and on down the line. Until you begin to see this, you can't, you can't begin to see what will change your mind. What will give you a completely and finally new outlook, viewpoint, toward yourself, toward society, toward your mother, toward your children, toward your grandparents, toward the politician and the policeman, so that you begin to see everything quite clearly. You see, you see what life is not all about. It is not all about success. It is not all about insisting that I must remain the center of my little world. It's not about making money. It's not about getting advantages. It's not about putting up a good appearance. Parents, it's not about staying physically young all your life. Because the understanding of life includes an understanding of death too. You see the whole thing. So beginning to see our folly and our foolishness, seeing what doesn't work, what doesn't change me, I can begin to have the sense, the brains, to begin to abandon them. Having seen they don't work doesn't make any sense. I have an ounce of sense now. I have an ounce of sense of seeing that trying to be elected to public office, trying to get more money than you, trying to impress you or whatever, doesn't do a thing for my eternity. It does only something for my physical, social self, both of which shall perish. And how dumb can I get to use my life here on earth, which is over in so short a time, to use my life here on earth to store up treasures that perish instead of treasures that are eternal. So, I will read again some of the things. Some of the things that do begin to change my inner self are awareness of self-damage, taking pain rightly, Get this one. I like this one personally very much. This is one of my favorite phrases of all. This is the following will begin to change the kind of a person I am or you are. Steadfastly hearing what I don't want to hear. Isn't that marvelous? Don't you agree with me that that's extra good? Steadfastly hearing what I don't want to hear. Does, look what that includes. Doesn't that include endurance? Doesn't that include courage? Doesn't it include self-honesty? If you tell me that I'm a hypocrite and I don't like that, but I say, well, I, w I would rather find truth than hate you for calling me a hypocrite because you just might be right, so I endure that. And I come back and the next night you say that I'm loaded with vanity. I don't want to hear you say that. Because I'm not a vain person. I'm really a very nice, casual, a humble person. But you say I'm vain. I don't like that. But if why do I get disturbed when you call me vain? Obviously, because I am. So I'm going to I'm going to see the value of continuing to hear what I don't want to hear, what 99% of me doesn't want to hear. This is valuable. This is intelligence. Human nature does change by, and. Listen to this one. Admi admission that I am trying to do the impossible. For example, and you, you put your own examples under this. Admission that I am trying to do the impossible. 
Example, I'm trying to find peace of mind by being someone in your eyes and in my eyes. I'm trying to find peace of mind by getting the college degree, by being the leader of the group, by being the senator from that state, from being thought of as the, as the firm, decisive, intelligent head of the family. I'm trying to get happiness out of mere ideas about myself. And as many of these false values that I attain, how come I'm still mad, still scared? Add your own examples about try, just seeing that the impossible doesn't work for us. <coughs> seeing where your mind is located, seeing where your mind is located, being aware of it, as I just mentioned, when you're in the market, seeing the psychological spot that you have permitted yourself to be kidnapped to, the seeing of that is the beginning of breaking the power of the psychic kidnappers who take us away who make us depressed, who make us irritable, who make us want to get false thrills out of criticizing other people. How many of you criticized anyone this week? Criticized mentally, mentally, outwardly. If you did it outwardly, it's because you're the superior one in that human relationship. The other one is submitting to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the courage to do it, which shows what a coward you are. Self-honesty about your actual hatred, Self-honesty about your actual hatred. Awareness of self-pictures as self-pictures. Who do you think you are? It's a good thing you don't see all at once who you think you are. Or you wouldn't be able to take it. Now I'll tell you one picture that you all have. You're someone, you're someone who should be treated as you think you should be treated. One self-picture you have is that you think you should be treated as you think you should be treated. Uh, how easily are you offended? That is how childish you are. The more easily offended I am, the more childish I am. Now, by that rule, how many mature people do we have in the room or listening to the tape? You take that one item alone. Other people don't treat you with the respect, with the love, with the kindness, with the consideration, with the attention. They don't give you the attention that such a marvelously exciting interesting person as you are should have. You can't figure out their poor judgment, can you? Simply see how you get upset because someone doesn't behave towards you the way you think they should behave and you will have one of the best tools for changing the kind of a human being you are than a thousand other rules maybe because you see because we get offended and upset and thrown off the track so often every day in the home down at the office and I've told you before and this is just a, a side issue to this if you expect if you expect a, a, a hyena to behave like a human being whose fault is it if he doesn't see you have expectations that other people, oh, other people should behave nicer to you than you do to them, right? So quite the question obviously is, how nicely do you behave toward them? How many of you are nicer in your behavior outward than you are in your thoughts toward other people? Huh? What do you call them after they turn away? Huh? Mm -hmm. See, we don't see truth emotionally. We don't see the, the full meaning of them, the significance of them. We don't see what truths can do for us. 
we hear the word and it sounds okay, the sentence sounds pretty good, not bad. But our whole being, to use that phrase, has to see it in order to get us authentically excited so that we look, so that we want to change our inner nature. So, as I give you this very simple sentence, and it's just made up of words, and words are still words, yet try to see something much deeper behind it than you've ever seen before. Try to feel, try to feel what it can do for you as a human being, as a young or middle-aged or older human being who's trying to do something worthwhile, really worthwhile with his life. And you'll never be the same again if you see this emotionally. So write down the following. Every experience can either shake me awake or put me deeper to sleep. Every experience can either shake me awake or put me deeper to sleep. Think about that. What did you do out in that backyard during the break that we just concluded? What did you do that either put you more asleep or shook you awake just a little bit? Were you watching yourself? Were you watching the, the quick glance? You were over in that part of the yard and someone was over in this part and you weren't talking about there's a quick, quick glance between you. What was your reaction to that glance of that person over on the other side of the yard there? And what was the significance of the reaction? Why the reaction? Can't you, can't you go beyond the mechanical, uh, having the, the experience of exchanging glances with someone to immediately investigate inside and see, for example, that you thought that that person's glance was hostile or curious or whatever? What did you put in the other person's glance, perhaps, that wasn't there at all? Little, tiny, tiny, tiny things like this we can begin to use to wake up or to go sleep, deeper into sleep. The glance again, immediately, because we're self-centered. Everything centers around me. Why did she look at me like that? What did he mean? What was, what was behind it? Is my hair mussed up? Whatever. Everything can, is around our self-defense. Maybe he or she disapproves of me. Can't you be free of that glance? Completely free of it. Free of the words, that critical word, or that praising word, or that boring word. Do you use boring people? People who you know can't do anything but run on and on and on. They have no choice but to do that. Can't you use that beneficially? You can use everything beneficially as long as you don't use it self-centeredly. You can use everything beneficially as long as you don't use it self-centeredly. But you don't know how self-centered you are. And one reason you don't know it is because you prefer to think, among other things, that you are interesting and that other people are really interested in what you have to say. Of course, they don't have their own life of their own. They may be wanting to think about their own life instead you blab into their ear. And I'm saying this, I'm saying this, and some of you or some of you listening to this tape will, will, didn't hear what I just said. You'll do it again. I know you will. Here, I'm telling you, I'm telling you directly that some of you will come up and blab in my ear nonsense, self-centeredness, not thinking, maybe I'd like my attention to myself for a minute. I'm telling you that you'll do it, and you didn't hear me, and you'll do it. Now, are we spiritually deaf or not? And I'm telling you that it's for your benefit not to bore other people.
you catch yourself right in the middle of a conversation sometime, right in the middle of it, and stop. And you do that, you'll have performed the miracle of the ages as far as you're concerned. Because that means that the minute you stop blabbing, you threw a log in front of your own mental truck and caused a great explosion of consciousness for maybe one second. You're beginning to change the being, you're beginning to change the kind of a person you are inwardly. And you're the only person who knows it, except other people who may be working with you, which is very rare anyway. Give you another example of how you can work. Many people come to this class, many people leave. You have brought people here, you've heard the comments as you leave. How does that affect you? The fact that people come here and come for a while or come one time and then leave? Any of you, for example, get shaken by that? I don't think most of you are shaken. I think you're beyond that, most of you, but some of you might be, might not be. As long as you are surprised by anything anyone does, you are asleep, period. You know why? You expected them to behave according to your expectations, desires, beliefs, ideals, hopes. You want them to behave in a way that makes you feel secure. And so your shock is simply a shaking of your own pseudo-security. This is why people crack up in a divorce or in a breakup of a romance. They would put their trust and they put their heart in the hands of the other person saying, ha, now I'm safe. This person is nice to me. He or she behaves the way I want he or she to behave. And I hope it continues this way. Don't you dare have hope at all that anyone will ever continue to behave toward you the way they've behaved nicely, perhaps, in the past. You're setting yourself up for a heartache and disappointment and probably bitterness and probably an increase in the state of your inner slumber because you won't be able to take it rightly. If you'd used small disappointments, 10 a day, 50 a day, if you'd used small disappointments, learned how to understand and handle them, then when the large one came along, it wouldn't touch you at all, and besides that, you would find that no one will ever leave you again because they never came into your life upon the invitation of your self-centered neurosis and need. Wouldn't that be a marvelous way to live? You're, you're inviting people into your life to your own sorrow. You're inviting them into your life hoping that they can fulfill you, do something for you, give you something, and then when they walk out you feel sorry for yourself and bitter against them. If you'd had an ounce of sense, if you'd been awake, then when someone comes into your life, they come into your life on the terms of your awakeness and nothing else. Otherwise, they don't get in. Then if they come in, see? If they come into your life, anyone, your parents included, anyone, boyfriend, girlfriend, then if they come into your life, it's on the terms of your rightness, your rightness, which is not trading, which is not bargaining, and you'll never get your heart broken again. I'll guarantee you because you never traded it with that other person to begin with. You finally got smart. 
he finally decided that being awake is the most practical thing you can ever do for yourself or for anyone else. Right? And when you're strong, real strong, and that other person wants to come into your life, he or she will sense the terms. As they knock on your door and you open the door, the expression on your face, the manner, will tell them the terms upon which they may come in. They know that. And now they won't try to take advantage of you. They won't try to trick you because they know from the start that you see through them. Now, dear sir or madam, come into my life. But if you start to behave foolishly, nonsensically, out you go. Now, let me explain something. This, this is consciously putting another person in fear. Now, let me, this is very tricky, so listen carefully. It is telling the other person, unless you want rightness, go. Now, because they have certain needs, certain needs, certain parts of them will agree to behave rightly, but other evil parts won't. And the evil parts are the parts that are in fear. Now, having said it one way that you put them in fear, you really don't. They put themselves in fear, but it appears as if you did, because God does not give the spirit of fear, you see. But it will appear to them that way, because they don't know that the fear is in them. So when they come into your life and you're awake, wide awake, you can detect the difference between the angels in them operating toward you and the devils in them operating toward you. And the minute you spot a devil, you scream out. And if you hesitate to scream out at the devil, they've got you. But I'll tell you, if you're fully awake, it won't happen. You'll scream at them. Now knock it off. Huh? Or get out. Take your choice. You can't behave with me anymore the way you used to. Because I made a decision in my life that I'm going to begin to behave rightly within. And I'm not going to let you come in and foul it up in any way at all. Look at the grief you're going to save yourself if you change the kind of a man, the kind of a woman you are. Aren't you tired of getting hurt in human relationships? Huh? Aren't you tired of being conned? Aren't you tired of trying to please people so that they'll be nice to you? And you hate them. Anyone you please, you hate. Nod your heads. Again, back to the point. Watch how people come to you and ask for things that you don't want to give. What do they want from you? Your companionship, your money in exchange for their products, whatever they are. You will go a long ways by developing an inner development of an attitude that very politely and courteously and firmly says, no thank you, I just don't want to give to you what you want from me. And if your attitude is pure, if it is really strong, they will detect it in your facial expression, in your manner, in your bearing, and that alone will prevent you from being assailed by people who want things from you that you don't want to give. 
Are you a disappointment to the people in your life? This has to be studied very carefully because some of the things they want from you may be quite legitimate. Some of the things you want from them might be quite legitimate and others are not. Try to see the difference in the two. Some of the things you want from people, a nice friendship such as we have in this class, that's legitimate, that's fine, that's good, that's healthy, that's necessary. Other things may not be. Begin to separate in your own mind things that it is proper for you to have from other people and things you don't need. And one way you can do that when you're being very watchful and you can begin to detect a strain in yourself, an unnaturalness in yourself, a nervousness, when you approach someone for anything at all, if you're in strain, you don't need it. If you're in strain, you don't need it. You're trying to get something from the other person that will make you feel, just feel good instead of something that you might get from them that would make you be a different kind of a person as we discussed last night. We're such a disappointment to ourselves, aren't we really? Why am I so weak? Why do I, why do I plead for this or that from other people? Well, I do that because I'm scared. I'm really scared, right? Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? And I'll conclude this by telling you that your fear is groundless. This anxiety, this tension you have, which you're trying to relieve from try by trying to get something from another person, it doesn't have to look. It's so simple. Look how simply we can state things. The fear that you have, which compels you to try to get illegitimate things from other people, it doesn't have to exist inside of you at all. You can, you can be the king of the world. You understand what that means, don't you? You can be king, king of your inner world so that you're not fawning, not requesting, not apologizing, not behaving wrongly toward anyone else. So we're never in fear of disappointing another person, not in fear of disappointing them and thereby losing the values we're getting from them or the values that are invested in our false self-image of being someone who is important to the other person. All right, going on from there. Over the months and years, ideas come to me for a talk, for a class session, or for something to put in a book. And I collect really hundreds of them over a year period, just little short ideas, short notes, which may not form a talk in itself or a chapter in itself in a book, but which has a certain value. So I put them down on a piece of paper, real scribble them down real fast and then forget them because they come so often and so fast I can't keep up with them, even in the middle of the night, although I don't get up in the middle of the night to write them down. And so they collect over the years, and I thought this morning, I just um, have a odds and ends comment morning. Little things that come up that may connect, in fact everything does connect, but uh, doesn't fit in exactly with a regular talk. So I may skip abruptly from subject to subject, but all of it is part of our purpose in being here to begin to understand our mind, our thoughts, our life and to change the kind of a thought, kind of thoughts we think and thereby change the kind of life we live. All right, one of them is this. When you watch a television story after this or read a book, a fiction, a movie, you know, any kind of fiction piece, cowboy story, detectives, social drama, whatever, if you will watch it carefully from the writer's viewpoint, which you don't do now, you're sitting there enjoying it, which is proper, 
but begin to see it from the following viewpoint because the writer himself has put this into the plot the story to make it interesting to you he knows what you want as an audience you want conflict lots of conflict nice little people sitting around quoting bible verses nobody's going to watch the, the program they want conflict they want change of pace change of scenery they want interesting characters all everybody is different you show any man on the screen or any woman no matter who they are and they become interesting because it's the first time you've ever seen them and then your curious curiosity fades and the writer goes on to the next point to keep you attracted to watching it all the time writers have thousands of little devices to make the story interesting and they are all based on very solid psychology of human beings and of human life. So you watch the following one out of a thousand writer's devices next time you watch stories on TV or read a book. It is this. The leading character, let's call him the hero, is introduced in the story at the start, right? And from that moment on, the minute he's, after he's introduced, his character, his inner state, either increases in maturity or he disintegrates. He goes in one direction or the other. That is, as the story develops, he goes up or he goes down. He becomes a better man or he becomes a worse man, something like that. Secondly, at a certain point in the development of the story, you watch this, if there was a professional writer is doing this, you are bound to see this. At a certain point in the story, usually comes about maybe halfway on, not at the, never at the beginning, rarely at the beginning. He is faced with the crossroads. He's faced with the decision where he has to go either left or has to go right. And his disintegration or his upliftment depends on which choice he makes. Now, if this is vague to you, you watch and you'll see it. You'll be able to pick it out where he finally, the man finally makes the decision to, well, I'm uh, going uh, to uh, treasure hunting or I won't or I decide to sacrifice my principles or I don't. Either an inner decision, one decision or one in outer action. Those two points. The character, the main character, either develops and at the end he is stronger than he was before or he's weaker and gets destroyed. And somewhere he makes that decision that sets him out, either going up or going down. Look how this is parallel to what we talk about in class here. You come to hear the truth, you come into the class here and you make a decision. And don't you know that out of that decision, this is serious now, and you know it is, out of the decision that you make when you come to this class, that not only the rest of your physical life depends on the decision you make, but all your eternity depends on it? So I've given you the illustration, and when you see this in a story, maybe it will remind you that you and I, every one of us, are either either increasing our consciousness, either going more awake, or we're taking the events of life to put us deeper into sleep, as we discussed last night. Now, in a story, usually there's only one major crisis decision, just one. Fortunately for us, we can make a decision the wrong way, but if we suffer enough, start to go low enough we can catch ourselves in time but I'll tell you and you know this there are people who have made the wrong decision repeatedly repeatedly so long and so often their eternity is fixed and you know people like that I know people like that you can see it in their faces what has this got to do with us sitting here you're going to make a decision right today, a lot of you, whether you're going to, maybe you've made the decision to keep coming back here and study. Why don't you make the decision to pay better attention? Why don't you make the decision to be rightly serious toward these things so that you'll save yourself a lot of downhill work if 
bring yourself to a halt as soon as you can so that it goes slower, slower, slower as you go down so that it halts. And then the story line is changed. Think of um, perhaps the hero turns into an alcoholic and he destroys himself or he commits a crime and he destroys himself or he does something that ends ends in spiritual and life suicide. Do you know people who have committed spiritual suicide? They are the people who have repeatedly rejected the truth to the point where there is no return. And when you get to the point of no return, this is not to scare you or anything, then Judas went out and hanged himself. All right. Happily for us, we can make the choice when we come to these dozens of choices every day in our life to set aside everything that's heavy inside of us, set it aside and say, I'm going to choose even as, as dimly aware, as unaware I am of the choice, of the right choice to make, I'm going to do the best I can to stop the downward slide and let something other than me help me make the choice, which is always something outside of your old nature to go on up. Write down a couple sentences, please. <clears throat> I must make an effort to wake up, but the awakened state itself is effortless. I must make an effort to wake up, but the awakened state itself is effortless. I must make an effort to wake up, but the awakened state itself is effortless. In other words, we're struggling to get ourselves out of the way and wake up to the point where there's no longer any effort because there's no false self there to fight the truth. How about this one? Write down the following sentence. I should never choose a friend on the same mental level as I am, for he will try to take me just as I wish to take him. This is serious, you know. This is no joke. I should never choose a friend on the same mental level as I am, for he will try to take me just as I wish to take him. You don't think so? You are taken to the extent that you like to take. All right. I should never choose a friend on the same mental level as I am, for he will try to take me just as I wish to take him. All right. The next point in this grab bag of comments and questions and odds and ends, you have to do a little work now. A person coming to the class here ask certain hostile questions of the teacher. You ever heard any? Ever heard any hostile questions at here? Okay. Please give us some example of hostile questions Ask the teacher. Ask to the teacher. What is your authority in teaching these classes? What is your authority in teaching these classes? One man asks, why don't you bring your God out and show him to us? Say that again. One man asks, why don't you bring your God out and show him to us? Yeah, and isn't that a stupid remark? Look, look, may I tell you, when you get to be teachers, don't answer stupid remarks. See to the man, don't make stupid remarks like that. Do you live what you preach? Yes, do you, do, do you practice what you preach? Is, that's the traditional way. Why is all your teaching so negative? Okay. <clears throat> We expected something more dynamic. Say that again. We expected something more dynamic. Yes, more sleep producing is what he means. The truth belongs to everyone. Why do I have to pay for it? Ah. <laughs> How come you're always so negative? Anymore. Now. Uh, yes. Are you in? An, are you enlightened? Am I enlightened? There are many roads to truth. 
so uh, I guess I'll go to California. <laughs> <laughs> Figure that one out. <laughs> really? What do you think of Christ? What do you think of Christ? Are you happy? Are you happy? Will you tell us what your credentials as a teacher are? Credentials. The ones that they're afraid to ask you, they will ask afterwards. You know, oh, sure. Uh, is he married? Is he really happy? Is, you know, on and on and on. Right. The whole business, yeah. What's his private life like? As if you're going to find out. <laughs> You and I are allies in this teaching. May I shake your hand and I'll never see you again. <laughs> yeah, only they don't add the last part. They do the last part. They pardon? They do. I've seen them. Oh, yeah, all right. I guess you're right, sure. Are any of you so dumb as to answer questions like that on their level and, and get the... Yeah. Don't you ever get defensive. Don't you explain yourself. Don't you know they, they want to... Look, you don't know how evil the devil is. We've had a lot of experience with this, Leland and I, down in L.A. and right here, for that matter. You see some. But if uh, the devil and a, a new person, it's usually a new person, you know, because then they leave and that's the end of it. They want to disturb that great teacher who is so poised and so powerful and is so authoritative and who comes right out and tells things as they are. See, where, where's his weak spot? Where can I get him? Where can I throw him by asking him an embarrassing question, a, a blunt question, a personal question? Nothing is too low for a person who is lost and wants to get a feeling of un of finding himself by asking a question. And he's going to watch me very carefully. And if he sees me defending myself, he's going to get a false thrill out of that. Never defend yourself against the devil. Never. You can scream at the devil. And it all depends. And don't you forget, and you've seen it operate right in this class, don't you forget that every person is different. And so you, you have to immediately, consciously size up the situation and answer that person individually. There's no blanket answer to every one of them. Did I see a hand, uh, Larry? Another comment. May I, as a teacher, have personal consultation with you? Yes, and they just want to blab in my ear. Any more comments while I look at this here? Oh, Duffine, yes. <coughs> Yes, a question I had been asked rather hostile. Don't you believe in Christ? And when I answered that we believe in finding out how we suffer, they didn't want to hear much more about it. Say that last part again. When, they, when I explained what our teaching is about, they mm. could find out the cause of our pain and suffering and no. happiness. They didn't want to hear anything about it. Right. Right. All right, here's an illustration. Uh, I may have to find the, the point after I give the illustration, but it fits in somewhere. I used to know a man in Los Angeles who had an enormous avocado grove right outside his home. He lived on a nice, big, pretty hill, and there's lots of room for avocado trees. And if you visited him, it's a very nice, pretty home on, up there, a big view. And he had, oh, maybe as many as a hundred avocado trees spread all out around his home there. And he'd give them away or he'd sell them. And, but it was very impressive that right here, in the, pretty much right in the city, but in a, in a hilly section, he had all these nice avocado trees. And repeatedly, people would come up to him, visitors, and they'd say, how did you, Walter, how did you get all these avocado trees? Uh, how can, how can I duplicate what you've done? And he gave him the simplest advice possible. He said, well, you just do what I do, what I did. I went down the nursery and uh, bought 10 trees, planted them. Next week I went down the nursery and got, planted them and took care of them. You know, what do people think there's some magic. How do you think things grow? How do you think things happen? Why don't you do what I do? Ah, now you see the point. That point suddenly struck me. <laughs> What's the magic? 
of you maybe getting rid of a little bit of your pain, getting a little control of your life back, very simple. You sat at home or I sat at home when we read that, that book that we didn't understand but we stuck with it and when a certain sentence suddenly leaped out at us, we, we get right feeling into it. We came to classes, we practiced the project, we worked hard when we didn't want to work and after a year or five years or twenty years or thirty years something up there began to recognize a sincere honest effort and sent its help down to the miserable little struggling little student and these higher impressions and higher truth came down and began to work for the student because he had he or she had made room for them hard work what else then you'll have your avocados the fruit of your labor right Let's see what else we have on the miscellaneous list. Oh yes, this is a, a little personal story, and I know what the point on it is. When I was in the army some years ago, we were out way out in the hills somewhere on a night march, and uh, we were tired and we had the heavy rifles and packs and heavy steel helmets on, and we were marching through the hills at night in a double column, column here and column there, all heading down somewhere. And we were exhausted, it had been a long day, and we were sagging, and, and I was marching uh, right in the right-hand column, and uh, dead tired. So, you know, if you're tired and yet uh, have to walk, you can practically walk in your sleep, right? Because you, your body knows how to keep going forward while your mind is growing. So I was marching along and rifle over here and all of a sudden I bumped into someone and I couldn't figure it out because if you're going in the same direction as everyone else, <laughs> how, how, can you bump, how can you bump into someone? And then I found out who I'd bumped into because I heard a voice shout, wake up! And I looked over and there was a little uh, gold bar on someone's shoulder there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a second lieutenant and what he had done the sneaky little man that he was he'd planted himself right facing the column right between us so as to jolt the sleeping <laughs> soldiers as they were marching along and I in my sleep I'd accidentally bumped into him and he gave me the shock of her wake up soldier what's the point of that somebody give me a point uh, the point is don't march through life asleep or a second lieutenant will shock you awake right and ball you up all right write down two sentences please the world moans comma quotation please go away and let me sleep end quote the world moans, please go away and let me sleep. Secondly, and see deeper into this than appears on the surface, please. There is no way to get what is truly good for me without first glimpsing what is truly good for me. There is no way to get what is truly good for me without first glimpsing what is truly good for me. If I set up my own judgments of what is good for me, where do those judgments come from? From confused parents, confused religious teachings? And I never question them in spite of the pain they give me, which means I'm stupid for not questioning the contradiction between the fact I say these are good for me and yet they make me feel bad. All right, now, the next question which I'm going to ask you calls for a bit of bravery and honesty. And what's your reaction both to the question and to yourself if you raise your hand to answer? How many of you here, please raise your hand if this applies to you, how many of you here have ever been disappointed in a particular meeting, you felt that you weren't getting enough from it, 
or to phrase it just a bit different, were disappointed in the way I handled the meeting. Oh. <laughs> okay, you know who you are who raised your hand. Sally, explain what you were disappointed in. I remember when the Sunday meetings first began, I thought this was the first mistake you had ever made in having us dodos get up and <laughs> get up and give our lesson to the class. Have you changed your opinion I since have then? I changed my opinion. In other words, I was right and you were wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> And I hope the rest of you go in a similar vein, but I'm afraid. <laughs> Why were you disappointed? Me? You, you raised your hand, didn't you? Are you you? The taping, when you had the tapings. Huh? When you had the tapings, I thought this was too much commotion and too much going on and it was too uncomfortable, and I thought I couldn't get anything out of it. Next. Who raised their hand? remember one time in particular that you didn't have a particular topic to talk on. You said we're just going to be very light and we'll just have questions and discussion and I remember being very disappointed and I was all oh. ready for I want to apologize for disappointing you. Okay, who has been disappointed in a meeting and the way the teacher conducted the meeting? Alicia is next. Yes, when you uh, change the format on Sundays from us giving a talk to uh, stand up in class and one of the members gave us a topic, I was disappointed. I, am, I didn't follow that, I'm sorry. Well, we on Sundays give our own talk, a, a subject of that we, any subject that we want to talk about. At one time you change it to a member of the class give us the yes class. oh and that was kind of a shock to me because i have a real nice <laughs> 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 yes w well understood no comment necessary uh mark you were disappointed how can we help you i'm disappointed in the class when someone comes in that's new and i think you should be more careful with what you say so that they aren't scared away. Give us a specific example, Mark. Specific. If you can think of one. Or say what you said again in another way. Either. Okay. Um, I'm disappointed because when a new person comes in and you're talking about these teachings, you might say something harsh. Such a, or something like uh, something that I think that they don't believe in, uh -huh. which might scare them away. Uh -huh. So I'm setting up that person and how they're thinking toward what you're saying. All right, fine. May I tell you something? I, I have never, ever, 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 since this class started, ever been harsh. Never. There has been harshness. I will guarantee you it was not in me. Where was the harshness? In the new person, in Mark, and some of you others who are still little cowards, who are afraid of the reaction to that person, especially if you brought them. Want to add to that any, Mark? No. Well, I understand your point, and they do too. Who else is disappointed? Dorothy's next. It was one, either it was last Sunday or some Sunday, and someone was uh, standing up and saying, and if you do that when you're sitting next to me, I'm going to tell you about it. And it was so obviously ego-centered. And the remark was so stupid that I was very surprised that I was disappointed that you let him get away with it. Oh. <laughs> you, you get away with 99 out of 100 things. I can't keep up with you. <laughs> I was disappointed that uh, you would not give me more shocks or give me more attention. Oh. 
I am to have to save you. Who else can I glower at? Connie. <laughs> Connie. <laughs> Connie's name. <laughs> there are, have been a few times when you've started the class with a long illustration, which I have objected to. What? Uh, you found it dull, or what was your particular problem? I guess I wanted you to start right out with a bang. <laughs> Okay. Don't I? Sometimes. <laughs> it's very necessary, by the way, in teaching to not get in a straight rut of saying things the same way, same formats. And I deliberately change things. Today was a good example of that. I know what you want, and so I'm going to disappoint you. Who? Uh, right here. Yeah. When the topic gets around to discussing why people leave, the reactions people had to people that come here and leave, for some reason I find it very disconcerting that, well, the thought comes up, why are you allowing us to discuss this thing? Can't we get on to something more relevant? That's the thought that comes in. More relevant than what? Yeah. Huh? More relevant than what? Well, you're, you're, you're talking. What are you talking about? Uh, when it, it seems like we jump in and, and just kind of stab these people, like, look at this. Uh, they left this great, glorious group that I'm identified with, and my goodness, how could they dare do such a thing? And this, besides sex, is the second leading thing that everybody jumps in on. Okay. Who else is disappointed? Chuck is disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I used to ask, make a comment, or, and you would say, Chuck, what are you talking about? And Leland could understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Leland was the only one that could understand it. Can I make a comment? Yes. Person to <laughs> okay, let's see the disappointed people. Let's get it over with. Get it out of your little psychic system. All right, then I'll ask you a question. I want to see the hands of those of you who can could conduct this class more efficiently, more valuably than I can. Oh, God. What? <laughs> All right, what would you like to talk about in general? You can keep that up if you want. And Leland, you can go back to that again if you want. Your usual nonsense. <laughs> Jean. I'd like to make a comment on, that, on what Leland said. His friend just sounds like now his mind is thinking, 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 and he's got to blame somebody because he's thinking thoughts instead of being busy watching them. And from what you said last night, we can't change our nature even by coming to a class every day. That's right. So. That's right. All right. How many of you have been disappointed in this class but didn't have the courage to raise your hand as I ask you to do? Who else? Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Ernesto, yes. why have you been disappointed uh, in the class? Uh, no, now, in this moment, no. But uh, in the beginning, when I started, you know, I, I, I expect the class to be different. You know? Yeah. <laughs> what are you disappointed I would like for you to come on stronger at times than, than you do. Come on stronger. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? I mean, I'm, I'm asking you to give me something that you can't give me. Uh, uh,
All right, we're in open discussion. Questions and comments from now on. Oddly. Yeah, scare the living daylights out of me. Where I have to, where it take me, where I have to crawl to come back to class and still come. Come out, okay. As long as we want that you save us, and we're always asking more than we can actually digest, we cannot make full value of what you give us every time, because that's a flaw of actually hearing what you say while ever needing. Mark. About the man saying, wishing you were stronger, we're the only ones who can make what you're saying become stronger by listening harder. Of by course. Listening. He put it as simply as you could, by listening harder, by listening with more receptivity. Look, this, which one, Richard? You know Richard? Richard and the rest of you have no idea how you've got that concrete wall that thick and that high between us. And you want me to become strong? You're not going to hear anything. You only hear one-tenth of one percent of, of what I say anyway. And this is why, in your daydream, you tell me to get stronger with you. You're not feeling the shocks that you should feel, which would be very beneficial to you. But you don't know you have the wall up. Who, uh, Rod, Jim. Yeah, that, that wall gets me disappointed. Sometimes I'll sit here in a class in a dull stupor, and I'm disappointed at myself for not snapping out of it. Okay, Jim. I, I don't know whether what Richard is referring to when he's, and some people say when they want it to become stronger. I remember going to a, a meeting many, many years ago where the man used to get into a very big tirade about the establishment and really Jim Hostel. And I could get a, a certain hostile value that I was identifying with him browbeating people. And I could see that this is a, a wrong way. Yes trying to associate in that and becoming stronger, that we don't understand what true strength or a strong teaching is. Yes. You want me to be real strong with you? I'm going to be as strong with you as I could ever be in the next sentence. Oh, you... Let me give you something strong. You can change the kind of a person you are. Isn't that powerful? Oh, you didn't feel anything. Wasn't that powerful? No, I'm afraid it wasn't. Dorothy. Last week I asked how I could go beyond this numbness that seems to come over me when I get to a certain point in negativity. And you said to look for the very small things daily and enter those. Was the reason for that is that the more deeply you can see the small shocks and then the more deeply you can go into the, into the bigger things? Say that last sentence again. Was the reason for your answering that way that the more deeply you can go into the small, like, humiliations and little shocks during the day, then the more deeply you can go into the bigger things? Yes, you have to take small shocks at first. You're not capable of big shocks at all. Then is that why this feeling of numbness, this emotional numbness, is a protection? Write down a sentence. Numbness is self-invited. Numbness is self-invited. If you're, if you're numb, if you're stunned, you have now relieved yourself of the responsibility of thinking intelligently about your life and the way out. Numbness is a very convenient and phony excuse for not working. Mm -hmm. And it's always invited by a cowardly little psychic system that doesn't want to work. Oh, I'm so confused. I guess I can't figure things out. I've always been confused. You want to be confused or you wouldn't remain confused. Yes, Joe. 
Is there a stage, though, where that numbness is a genuine numbness because you have terrified the devil in us? Yes. Like, yes. that you do go through? Yes, but and then you see, beyond that, we give the solution, so to speak. If you're shocked in here, of course you get a certain, you want to use the word shock or the word numbness, and then I tell you why you have that numbness. You have it because self-enclosure is the most important thing to you. Self-enclosure and numbness always being together, you see. But we try to tell you that if you want to cease to have a, a numb mind, a shocked mind, then you can give up your love for being numb. You love it. It's your protection. How many of you also sense that you're getting the truth from your teacher? Mm -hmm. See? See both at once. Maybe in the, in the, to Richard's statement, uh, could you explain, like, you can't take the kingdom of heaven by force, but Jesus saying? Uh, Alicia. Well, going back into the female role, it says, if I would have been a female before, I wouldn't have as many mistakes and, and pick up the men's ideas. I would have pick up a strong man. But because I'm not, I always have nothing but a merry-go-round going. You know, you have to think like a woman or think like a man, and then also think above those. But you need to think like a woman think like a man and think like someone who is neither a man nor a woman. You need both while you're occupying the physical body. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yes. Is it clear to you? Yeah. Well, in reference to this being able to, asking you to give us more, uh, the only way that I can personally take more is when I can take more first out there. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Richard, Richard, do you intend to come to these classes all the time? Where do you, you live here? Where do you no, live? No, I live in Dallas. Huh? In Dallas? You live now. Or do you intend to come when you can and study and work hard? Or are you going to fall away? Which is it? Do you know? No, I don't. I'm trying to get you to understand. You say you want more. Let's find out whether you mean it or not. Let's find out whether when you go back to Dallas, whether you read your books, whether you study, whether you come here every chance you get. You sit here and say you want more. Do you mean it? Mm 